Okay, thank you very much, Rachel, for introducing me. So as Rachel said, I'm a technical art historian and I'm the lead researcher on the Whistler Pastel project in which we are carrying out a technical examination of Whistler's pastels in an attempt to further understand their materials and methods. So to briefly talk about the project, the project started last year, September 2022, and is funded by the Lunder Foundation, which is part of the Lunder Consortium, which is an international consortium which includes the University of Glasgow, but also museums in the United States, Col Colby College Museum, the Freer Gallery, the Frick Gallery and the Chicago Art Institute. Because of this international consortium, we've, we're very lucky that we can study works not only in our own collection, but also works in their collections to broaden and widen the scope of this research. The project focuses on pastels because this is a largely understudied area of Whistler's work. The majority of technical examination or even art historical examination that has happened and research that has happened on Whistler has happened within research on his oil paintings, on his watercolours and etchings, etc. But not so much on his pastels, though there is some art historical research already existing. This specific study is an initial study into the materials. There is incredible, there's a lot that we can still discover. There's a lot to study. Um, so this research does not propose that at any point we can identify and, and study everything in this one study, but it does provide a first, uh, first indication of what Whistler used. And this research is focused on the materials that Whistler used. So part of that is for the research questions that we focused on what kind of paper did Whistler use for these pastel drawings? What pigments did he use? Was he consistent throughout his career? Did he use fixative to attach the pastel more strongly to the paper or did he not? And this also relates to how did Whistler make his pastel drawings? How did he apply them? Did he have a certain methodology or not? And all of this in the end also relates to the fact that pastel drawings are generally considered to be fragile works of art because the pastel is not strongly adhered to the paper and can fall off or be disturbed quite easily. So a question simply is, are the pastel drawings fragile? And if yes, what does this mean for the preservation and conservation of these works? How can we still exhibit them in a safe way? Another question that we've got is how do Whistler's pastels relate to his other artworks, to his oils, to his watercolors, to his etchings? And how does Whistler's study use of pastel compare to other artists of the late 19th century who works in pastel? Think, for instance, of Edgar Degas. So now we've talked a bit about James McNeil Whistler, but I don't know to what extent he is known to you. James McNeil Whistler was an American born artist who worked mainly in London and Paris. As I've already mentioned, he is an oil painter. He works in watercolor. He made a lot of etchings, lithographs and pastels. Um, he was famous not only as an artist, but the, he, there's quite a famous trial that happened in 1879, which is the Whistler versus Ruskin libel trial. I mention this because this trial led to a change in his pastel work that we can see. We can see that there, this was a pivotal moment in his life that changed the role of pastel in his career. The Whistler versus Ruskin trial, will, trial, trial was about the fact that Whistler sued Ruskin for libel after Ruskin, who is an art critic, wrote a scathing review of one of Whistler's oil paintings. Though Whistler won, he didn't really get anything for it. He still went bankrupt. After this, and following this trial, Whistler travelled to Venice, sponsored by the Fine Arts Society, to create a series of etchings. He was supposed to be there for three months, but instead he stayed there over a year and made over 100 pastels and over about 60 etchings in that time period. And this is the most productive period, short period of time he was there for over a year, that he made so many pastels and he really wrote about his love for pastel as a material. To show you a little bit of the different types of subjects that Whistler addressed in his pastels, we, we have this beautiful slide here, which shows that in the top left corner right here, this is a dress study for an oil painting of Mrs. Franz, uh, of Mrs. Leyland. Underneath it, we have an early landscape. This is a work from Venice up here. Then we've got a dancing girl, a design for wallpaper, a portrait of a, oh, a, portrait of a figure um, of I've forgotten the name, I'm afraid. <laughs> then we've got a nude study with some drapery in which he explores drapery. And lastly, there's from later in his life, he created a series of mother and child drawings. As you can see in all of these works is that the paper is clearly visible. 
Whistler never tried to cover the entirety of the surface with pastel. And because of this, it is so important that we consider not only the pigments that he used and how he applied them, but also the paper. We know that Whistler was particular about the paper that he used for etching and lithography, specifically looking for old papers, even cutting them out of books if he liked the specific tone or um, surface texture of it, and using these for creating different, slightly different variations on similar etchings. But what about the paper that he used for his pastel drawings? What is known about them? We know that Thomas Way, a friend of Whistler's, gave pastel paper to Whistler before Venice when he was bankrupt. We also have a letter in which Whistler writes to Delatre requesting packing or wrapping paper, talking about how he liked the texture and the feel of that paper so much. So what we try to do is to see how can we see evidence of this in Whistler's actual drawings. Now we've studied the paper quite closely and looked at it with a microscope and we've identified two types of paper. The first one is sort of a 19th century recycled paper. Now I do say recycled between inverted commas because it's it's not really the term that they would have used, but it sort of explains the different types of fibers that you can see in the paper, because there's small fibers, big fibers, chunky bits of um, paper uh, fibers, for instance, here and here, there's some inclusions, red and blue fiber, which, in, which suggests that it wasn't made as a very high quality paper. Instead, it seems to be rather low quality paper, which could be evidence that he might have used indeed wrapping paper as he wrote about. Another type of paper we've identified is specifically found in some of his Venice pestles. When we looked at the paper and saw that they are actually of a higher quality than the paper that we've seen in other pastels earlier and later than Venice. And this paper reflect is, is still very fibrous at the surface, which you like for pastel because pastel adheres to paper simply because of the surface texture of the paper. So it's still very fibrous, which creates that nice surface, but it doesn't have as many different kinds of fibers and different inclusions as the recycled paper had. And when we compared it to a paper sample reference book, it seems similar to Angra paper. It's not the exact same, but it shows that it is a higher quality paper that more likely is to be artist's paper. Oops. Now, the way that, what kind of paper you use does affect the effect you create with pastel. And we studied Worcester's pastel application quite closely today. There are still many questions about this, but what we have noticed so far is that he used a varied application. He played around with pastel. He used both thin, light and dry strokes to create sharp lines, which are relatively thin lines, but also he used a softer pastel to create larger areas of color, which cover the surface of the paper a bit more. At the same time, sometimes he would smudge and blur the edges of different color fields to blend them together or to soften the outlines. He also used not so much overlaying colors where he layered one color on top of the other, but rather he used small strokes of pastel of different colors next to one another, sometimes with one color slightly overlapping the other. And in this, he also used various shades of one color, which I'll show you in the next slides. One thing that was lovely to see actually was that there's one point, and I'll show you this again, where he pushed the crayon down with the flat side onto the paper, twisted it and lifted it off to create this bright highlight. So overall, what we saw is that he played with texture and contrasting shades, and he's always looking for color harmony in the picture, which is not surprising for Whistler. This is something that he did in his watercolors, in his etchings, in his um, oil paints. He was always looking for harmony. So here we have Florence Leyland in a green and orange dress on the right and two micrographs taken off the surface. So as you can see from a distance, the orange skirt actually appears to be maybe two tones of orange. But when we looked at it more closely, we can see that there's three shades of orange that were used in the skirt and that they are very thinly applied and slightly overlapping. At the same time, what was lovely to see is that this green of the dress is very pale. It's very pale green. But when you look at it under the microscope, you can still see the very vibrant green particles that made up this pastel crayon. This is not a faded pastel, by the way. This is just the shade it was. It's just a very pale shade of green. And as I mentioned, here we have in the head of this figure, this is Ava and Gladys Carrington sitting on the sofa. In her hat, we can see this beautiful pastel mark where he put it down, twisted it and lifted it back up. 
to create this highlight. And underneath the arm here, you can see an area of smudged pastel where it's been slightly rubbed together to create them. So it often ends up being a little bit of a murkier area than the sharp outlines that you can see alongside it. Not only were we interested in understanding Whistler's, how he applied the pastel, but actually what pigments did he use? Um, now, this is quite a complicated question to answer. And it has to do with ver a variety of um, complications, one of which is simply the complexity of pastel crayons as a material. Very simply put, a pastel crayon exists out of pigment, a filler, often white chalk or clay, and a gum as a binding medium to, to make sure that the stick stays together. However, because pastel can't be mixed in the same way that you can do with, for instance, oil or watercolor paint, where you can mix two different paints to create a different shade, you can't do that with pigments. So instead, what they did was that you could buy an entire array of colors in pastel. And they went, for instance, you could go for a pure red and then dilute the red until it's nearly white and make it darker by adding black or other, other colors. Because of that, when you analyze pastel, you hardly will ever find a single pigment in a single crayon. Even when it comes to the fillers, adding chalk, etc., these affected the way that the pastel could be handled and, and the qualities of the pastel. And again, this makes it more complicated. For this specific study and the way that, pa that Whistler used pastel, we were unable to take samples from the objects to actually sample the pastel and analyze it in more detail, meaning that we only work with non-invasive analysis, which can still tell you quite a lot, but it means that your results are less detailed. Another effect, another thing that affects the way that we can understand pastel is the history of an object. The history of an object always affects how we see it now, how we understand it now. When it comes to pastels, because of the um, not because the pastel is not strongly adhered to the paper, but instead sort of lies on the paper and, and attaches itself to the roughness or the texture of the paper, if a pastel drawing is, sh is shaken or is turned upside and back down, is placed somewhere a little bit harder and there's a little bit of a bump, the, either the pastel can displace itself and move across the surface or simply can be lost. So understanding the pastel now means that we have to consider all the things that could have happened to it throughout history. And lastly, when it comes to analysis, once again, a complicating factor is the spot size that we can analyze. What you can see here is the spot size of X-ray fluorescence analysis. We analyze actually what is within the red circle. What you can see here is that the yellow line of pastel is smaller than my spot size. This means that any analysis that I do, any kind of analysis that I do in this spot, I will get more information than only what I want from that yellow line. And that includes the paper information about the paper behind it because we can't control where the analysis stops. And this is an example of a Coleman's catalog and shows how pastels were sold in the 19th century. To better understand pastels and to understand what we're doing, not just on the on the works where often things aren't as pure as we'd like them to be. We are creating a reference library. I was very lucky to be able to go to the National Gallery of Art in Washington and study a 19th century pastel box they have there, take samples from this and analyze these to create a bit more of an understanding of what is actually going on within the pastel crayon. And it's really interesting to see that when we look at these microsco microscopy images of pastel crayon samples, the top one is of a brown crayon. But when you look at it closely, it's actually a combination of blue, red, white and brown pigment that make up this crayon. And that shows, again, how complicated these crayons actually were. And underneath it, we have a light blue, which largely consists of white and blue pigment, or blue pigment with a filler. And the last one at the bottom here is a green pastel. And it was nice to see that at the bottom here, oh, I keep going in. At the bottom here, there's a yellow particle that's visible, showing that this crayon isn't just a green, it's actually either a green mixed with yellow or could even be a blue pigment with, mixed with yellow to create this green tone. All of this is not to say that it's impossible to find things about pastels. Actually, we have been able to find out quite a bit about the pigments. There are still many questions that we can't answer fully, but we have found indications of what pigments were used. And these largely are pigments such as chrome orange and chrome yellow, which were new pigments in the 19th century. 
also vermilion was used. And one of the tricky things is that we weren't able to identify the presence of iron oxide, certainly. And this has to do with the paper. When we analyze the paper itself, it already has iron in it. That means that when I do an other analysis and I measure through the pigment, through the paper, I can't tell whether the iron I find is in the paper or if that's the iron oxide pigment. However, logically, and knowing about pigments from the 19th century, it is very likely that iron oxide pigments were used in pastel crayons. So as you can see, there's anything marked with a star or a little um, roof tile, I've forgotten the name for it, um, it needs more analysis to be able to, for, to exactly identify what it is, whether it's present or not. But we have found an indication that it might be present. But of course, as I said, the history of an object is rather important when we study it. And this is actually a beautiful example of how the history can change an object. In this case, I was at the Frick Gallery looking at a pastel. And when we looked through the object history file, we found an old photograph, which showed a corner mark and a note relating to a number and the size of a frame. These notes were regularly made by Whistler in preparation for exhibitions to name the number of the pastel, but also give the size that the frame would have to be. And the corner mark indicates where the frame had to start, like where the frame would start on the pastel. However, when we looked at the object itself, we couldn't see this anymore. It had been removed. And you can just about make out these areas in raking light, where you can see it's been very carefully removed. And it is not entirely clear when this happened, but um, it likely, it, it happened while the work was in the collection. And it might have been done by someone who didn't realize that this was something that the artist did. Um, and it was maybe considered to be interfering with the object, um, with the service of the object. But that also raises questions. So we have past treatments, but how might we treat the works in the future? Overall, so far, the works that we've seen show that the pigments are relatively stable. However, the paper is not stable. And because, as I said, the paper is such an important part of these works because it's so clearly visible, we have to consider it as well. As you can <laughs> see in this drawing of Portrait of Missy von Forster, is that the outline here, the, the extreme outline where it's lighter brown, is where it was hidden behind the frame and less exposed to light. And where it's been exposed to light, it has discolored. If you can imagine that this lighter brown would be behind all of the figure, behind the entire figure, you might you might see a different contrast between the pastel and the paper, and you might think of the work slightly differently. And this is why it's important to also consider when we consider these works and, and consider whether they should be exhibited and how they should be exhibited, that we take um, the paper into account as well. Now I would like to share with you some of the questions that we actually still have and we are currently still researching. One of which is this beautiful question from the Cemetery of Venice, where we are wondering what the sketching media is. Whistler always made an, out, an outline of the scene and then filled it in with colour. In this case, the material is not black chalk or black pastel and it's not graphite or pencil, as we've seen in other drawings, it's something else. We're not yet entirely sure what it is, but we're trying to figure it out and working that out at the moment. Another interesting um, pastel is this, the, the Beggars in Winter, which is at the Freer Gallery of Art. When we studied this work and we looked at it under raking light, we could see that all of the outlines around the figures, all of the perspective lines have been scored in. We don't know exactly why, but we think it happened after the pastel was complete. We know that there's also a netching of this same scene. And actually, when we roughly out overlap, overlap the two images, you can see it's the inverse of one another. But also what was interesting to see was that we could actually align the group of figures with each other. The rest of the scene would be slightly off, side, off put, but the figures overlined, overlapped. So we don't know exactly yet whether the scoring might have happened with an etching needle in preparation for or in, in a study for the etching. And this is something that we're still trying to figure out. And we also, we are lucky to have the plate for the beggars actually at the Hunterian. So this is something that we will be looking into in the future. So to sort of round up what we're doing now is we're looking at mock-ups for sketching media. So drawing out the different sketching media, looking at them underneath the microscope, analyzing them in any way that 
can add to our understanding of these pastels. Additionally, we're going to do mock-ups of the scoring in. What happens if we apply pastel first and then score in? What happens when we score in before the pastel is applied? How does that look underneath the microscope? And does that change how our current understanding of the scored in pastel? We are working on creating this reference library so that we can better understand what we find on the pastel drawing and what we know to be potentially present in pastel crayons. And lastly, one thing that we are exploring and what we love to do, but depending on time, we can we have to determine whether or not we're doing this, is we're going to try to see if we can classify the different types of paper that were used by Whistler using RTI, which is Reflectance Transformation Imaging. And effectively, it allows you to view the surface texture of an object from all different angles with lights. So you can see the surface texture in raking light from all, the, all angles and dig digitally manipulate these images. We hope that this might be able to help us in potentially dating works or linking works together based on the paper that were used um, at different times. I hope this was interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Oh, it keeps skipping. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you so much, Tess. That was so great to hear what you've been working on. Um, I know here again what's you know going on behind the scenes like at the Hunterian. Um, if, as Tess said, if anyone does have any questions, you're very welcome to take yourself off mute. You can, um, you know, turn on your mic. Um, I will give people um, a wee minute um, to do that. Um, I think Steph's got his hand up. Yes, Steph, would you like to take your mic off? Your mute off, sorry. I have, I think. Hi, Perfect. Rachel. Hi, Tess. Hi. Um, I, I think um, maybe just to announce that this research will be subject of a small exhibition, um, possibly about a year from now, yes. more or less. Um, so um, hopefully, you know, we will know as much as there as we can know at this point in time, um, and we will uh, share that um, with uh, the audience in the uh, Huntington Art Gallery. Brilliant! That's great. I didn't know that. Hmm. So um, I'm guessing then, you know, of the work that Tess is doing to, you know, to study the fragility of the different works, that'll be really, you know, essential then to deciding mm -hmm. what is going to go on display. Yep. It's a, it will be a life, a life trial of sorts. Um, and will this exhibition travel to U.S. museums? And the answer is no, unfortunately not, because ex exactly because of the sensitivity of the objects. Um, um, that that will that's highly unlikely, um, but there are good collections in the U.S. Mm -hmm. that may go on show following this, um, but we have not heard anything firm. Okay, no, that's great. Um, that must be quite exciting for you, Tess. Oh, it's very exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's quite. It's a, it's a challenge to to try and 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 compass this all in an exhibition, but it's very exciting, and I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to sharing it with everyone. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. That's great news. That's a really exciting, you know, output from a project that you know you've obviously um been working so hard on. Um, I'm going to take a wee look in the chat here because I think we have. Oh, okay. Sorry, Steph. So that was you answering the question there from Eva Jane. Mm -hmm. Will the exhibition travel to the US? But no, um, that makes sense if they are very delicate, um, delicate pieces. I think Gordon's got his hand up. Gordon, would you like to take yourself off mute? Yeah. Hi, Tess. I just want to ask. Uh, it's really interesting, but I'm just interested. How do you safeguard against this being a recipe book for forgers? That is an interesting question. Realistically, forging is really hard to actually manipulate it to a certain extent. And especially when it comes to pastels, actually, finding the exact composition of pastel crayons is incredibly difficult. Um, not only because it's a pigment mixture, the pigments you might be able to identify, but it has to do with the proportions of pigments. It has to do with the proportion of pigments to filler. And then also how much binding medium do you actually use? Um, and I didn't explain this in the talk because I can talk about this quite a while, but um, pastel crayons, the binding, the, the amount of binding medium that is used, and it's often a gum, um, indicates whether something is a hard or a soft pastel. However, the binding medium amount is so minute that it's very, very hard to, from a sample nowadays, um, even identify what the binder is. You need to do highly specific, highly detailed analysis for that, something like pyrolysis, um, high-performance liquid chromatography, for instance. 
without that you you with the analysis that i'm doing i can't really even identify the binder um because it's it, it there's so little of it um so this complicates in general whether or not you would be able to reproduce these recipes um and then there's another thing, if people are interested in a way in recreating materials from that time period, there are manuals from that time period that explain how you can make these things. Um, so if someone was really desperate and wanted to try and make their own pastels, you can you can look up a 19th century pastel manual and it will explain to you how you can make your own pastel crayons. Now the recipes for these versus the recipes that were used by Colorman who produced a lot of the crayons at the time, might be different and the colorman hardly ever liked to share what exactly how they make their materials um but i wouldn't worry in that sense too much about providing information that will allow a forger to actually recreate the materials okay thanks thank you thanks gordon and thank you tess and um, that was an interesting question um, I had a question, Tess, and apologies mm -hmm. if I missed that. The um the two girls on the sofa, yes. um, that wasn't a standalone work, was it? No, is there a is there an oil painting? Um, there's not an oil painting that I'm aware of at this time, but I know that there is um they were very popular models that Whistler used a lot in the 90s, in the 1890s. And um there's actually there's this drawing and there's another drawing with the exact same title, Ava Gladys Carrington sitting on the sofa. And then there's another one that's called the Beat Stringers, which is the same two girls sitting on the sofa doing certain activities. So it is part of a sort of a wide a, a series of works that he did with these two models. Um, but there are several, I, as far as I'm aware, these don't relate directly to an oil painting, but I might be mistaken. Right, okay, because I was wondering, um... You know, because you spoke about how he had specific techniques and that well, um, you know, across his pastels. But mm -hmm. when you spoke specifically about how he would push the crate, push the pastel down to kind of turn off and get this, you know, perfect kind of like highlight. Um, it was it was just making me think about, you know, the effort of him developing techniques for pastels. If the pastel, you know, in that account was maybe his trial run, you know, why would he almost go to the effort of developing a technique for pastels if that wasn't actually what he was going to that wasn't what the end result was going to be you know and he wouldn't be able to apply that technique to his paintings I just thought that was quite interesting why would he develop it's it's a tricky for... one um and actually it's something that we can see throughout his work whereas sort of this is why I said Venice is a bit of a turning point for him because before Venice there are far more pastels that are studies for oil paintings or that were dress studies for oil paintings mm -hmm. but actually after Venice it's not to say that they don't exist anymore because they do, but there are far fewer works that were meant as studies or um, sketches for another work. Actually, the majority of the pastels from after Venice were just made as finished drawings. And, it, and this also has a little bit to do with the subject matter that he depicted um, in his pastels, which isn't represented in this, to the same extent in his oils and watercolors. Um, okay. So okay. I hope that sort of answers No, it does. No, that's bit. great. Thank you. Um, I was also going to ask, because I know that from our last Whistler exhibition, was that in 2022? Um, I'm sure I think it was 2022. Um, that's terrible. I can't remember the exact year, but it was recent. Um, so I know that in 2021, thank you, Steph. Um, so I know that in that exhibition, you know, we had Whistler's artist materials on, you know, on display. And again, mm -hmm. apologies if I missed this in your talk, but do we actually have any of his pastels? Unfortunately, no. Okay. Okay. We have a lot of his pastel drawings, we have a lot of his artist materials, but um, they do not include any pastels. Okay. And that is a shame. <laughs> I would that have is... loved it if that had been the case. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that made, that might have made some of your research a bit more straightforward, potentially, yes. as well. Like, it would have, but no. Okay, no, I was just interested to hear those. 